Hello there, I'm Shark Yusufzai, Chairman of the Board of the uh, AICHE Foundation, Board of Trustees, and I'm here today with uh, Mark Vergnano, the recipient of the 2018 American Institute of Chemical Engineers Industry and Government Leaders Award. Congratulations, Mark, on the uh, winning of the award and the outstanding keynote address that you gave today. Thank you. Uh, Mark uh, was named President and CEO of Comores prior to its spinoff from DuPont in 2015. And he led the company to an amazing transformation in just three years. As Mark was talking this morning, uh, I took some notes and it is uh, really a great honor and pleasure to uh, be with the CEO of a company that was named Company of the Year by Chemical and Engineering News for leading transformation. Um, I was uh, looking at your share price today it's 51.92, up from $4, uh, from a loss of $90 million to uh, a profit of nearly a billion. You've reached uh, Fortune 500 uh, company status, uh, you know, a great increase in your market cap and revenues. And you all attributed this to a cultural transformation. And you, in fact, called it a cultural revolution based on five transformative values. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, uh, sure. Obviously, you know, I, I made a comment that uh, Peter Drucker has made this comment that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast right. every day of the week. And yeah, we really believe that because cult we did some really hard things to, to turn the company, but the culture really was what was behind this transformation. And we talk about five different values that we have ranging from uh, uh, safety obsession all the way down to something we call collective entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So they're very, very different kind of values, but those five have really been the tenets mm -hmm. of the culture that we've been trying to create mm -hmm. within Comores. Great. And you illustrated a couple of those, collective entrepreneurship and simplicity. Could you uh, kind of uh, do a deep dive into those and tell us how that comes along? Yeah, so I'd say the two of the five, so uh, collective entrepreneurship, and something we call refreshing simplicity mm -hmm. have probably been the two that have really changed. We have three others, mm -hmm. uh, being customer-centered, uh, having an obsession about safety, something mm -hmm. we call safety obsession, and really about having just deep integrity. So mm -hmm. those three, I'd say, are, think of those foundational. But these other two mm -hmm. have really been the change that's happened. Uh, collective entrepreneurship is fundamentally about having everyone in the company, all 7,000 people, feel like they own the place. Mm -hmm. Feel that, that what they can do is make a difference every day into the company and want to do that. Mm -hmm. And so you have to create the encouragement, but you also have to create the environment that allows ideas to not only bubble up, but the ideas actually to take hold mm -hmm. and people responsible. I was talking to someone after the talk, and they said, well, how do you get somebody to do that? And I said, well, one, you encourage them. Mm -hmm. But when you bring an idea, the other thing I say is, Okay, now you're responsible for driving the implementation of that. People like to give ideas, but when they also know that they're going to be responsible for driving it, and we're going to give them the resources to do that, you start seeing a different dynamic in a person. Some mm -hmm. people just jump on that. Other people take a step back and say, well, I want to give you the idea, but I don't know if I want to really drive it through. Mm -hmm. When you do both of those, you create this um, culture inside that makes people really involved, makes mm -hmm. them empowered, but also makes them part of the, the solution mm -hmm. as well. The other uh, 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 cultural aspect, the value that you brought mm -hmm. up, uh, refreshing simplicity, mm -hmm. is all about flattening the organization, putting decision rights where they need to be, mm -hmm. and don't go off of that. So if you have a decision right around mm -hmm. price, or if mm -hmm. you have a decision right about the shifts you want to operate mm -hmm. in a plant site, you get to take that decision, mm -hmm. and what that creates is speed. Mm -hmm. um, so speed isn't one of the five values, nice. but with collective entrepreneurship and refreshing simplicity, what mm -hmm. you get as an outcome of that really is speed. Right. So in terms of decision rights, how do you prevent people from delegating upward? You know, that sometimes many of us can do because uh, it absolves us from the responsibility, and uh, you know that really is a negative impact on corporate culture because people don't have accountability. That's right. Uh, so how, how did you transform that? that? That took a while because we had embedded in our culture mm -hmm. was a, let me check mm -hmm. with my boss, right. right? Let me see what they think about this. Um, 
So what we so it's really the the leader's job to push that back down because if you think about it, that's who's in control of this. So if you allow someone to move a decision to you, that's your fault, mm -hmm. right? Push it back down to where it belongs. You're more than welcome to give input. Mm -hmm. You're more than welcome to collaborate with that person, but really allowing them. So mm -hmm. what we found is it's not the role of the, the decision maker. It turns out to be the role of the decision maker's supervisor mm -hmm. to say, no, that's yours. Mm -hmm. You get it. You, you make it. I will support you, whatever you do. I'm not going to second guess you on this, because that's your decision, mm -hmm. right? And what we also try to encourage people, because it gets a little uncomfortable for folks who haven't experienced that right. before, what we tell them is, listen, we know every decision is not going to be the perfect one. Mm -hmm. So if, it, if you made a wrong decision, or if you made a decision that at the time, you know, six months later you realized, I need to make a different one, then make the next one, mm -hmm. right? Correct it. That's your job as well. Mm -hmm. So we're not asking you to be perfect. Mm -hmm. What we're asking you to be is thoughtful. Mm -hmm. So that if you did something and that was turns out to be the wrong decision, mm -hmm. come back right behind that and make a better one right. and go fix that. I, we, we changed a policy inside Comores early on about, it's gonna sound very mundane, but it was travel policy. Mm -hmm. And um, we had gone to the organization with this idea that you, know, you had to get approval from two layers above you if you wanted to veer off of the travel policy. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, we just <laughs> brought the whole company to the screeching halt right. and people came back and said, this is really a dumb decision. And we sat as a leadership team and said, you know, this is really a dumb decision, let's go correct it. And within a week we were able to go back and correct it. And I think people realized, okay, yeah. so you can admit that you made a wrong decision and go fix it and that's what we're trying to drive. You talked about the difference between collaboration and consensus. Can you uh, tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so consensus um, sounds like it's friendly, right? But what, what we found is it ends up, you know, in a consensus scenario, let's say four people are, are talking about a decision. One person gets to veto, if you think about it. Anyone in that four can veto, which means you can't go on, even though the other three might be driving for something. So we have found that consensus waters down decisions, waters down bold moves. What we like is something we call collaboration, where those same four people can collaborate, and you want the input, you want inclusion of ideas from different places. But whoever the decision maker is, after they've heard everything, needs to make the decision. And the rest have to get on board with that, uh, and you can move along. So. Bold ideas can stay bolder. Uh, you don't water them down. Um, and it, you know, it's a different concept at first because it's not about, well, Shark, I'm gonna listen to you, but, right. but I don't really care about what you say. It's a, it's, you really have to listen hard to everyone's point of view and then make that decision. And if you do it well, people will come along mm -hmm. with you and you can actually get things right. done. Again, the outcome of that is speed. Right. You can get to the things faster. Right. So I thought a very interesting aspect of your culture of collaboration was your collaboration with the University of Delaware and putting a $150 million hub for R&D there. Uh, could you talk a little bit about why you did that and what you expect to get out of it? Yeah, it really started with, uh, we have 27 disparate labs across the Wilmington, Delaware area, primarily co-located with DuPont because that's where we spun from. And so we wanted to consolidate because we wanted to get the energy of consolidation of the organization learning from each other. Um, we have over 300 researchers uh, in those facilities and they're all disparate, right? So they don't get to talk to each other. So we wanted to put them together. And then when we talked uh, uh, to the University of Delaware when we first spoke to them, this idea popped up about, well, what if you put it on our campus? And what if you, uh, we're able to share the knowledge between your researchers and our professors and grad students, and we can actually work collaboratively on things. And as you can imagine, uh, in your time in industry, the issue that popped up was IP. Right. Right. How are you going to solve the, the the IP side? And I'd say, with a very small group of people, we quickly were able to solve that by deciding what stays with the university, what stays with Comores, and how the rest can be shared in a way that everyone wins from that point of view. And as I've told our team, 
if we can get new ideas from, from a different source that can aid our customers, that can bring new products into the marketplace, that can make the world a better place, um, why wouldn't we try for that? And, and I, I'm very excited that, and I can tell you, our organization is off the charts excited because it's going to bring a whole new energy to be able to be mixing it up with, with professors, but more importantly, mixing it up with students. And we also think it's going to be a funnel or a pipeline for future talent for the organization. Oh, you know, in terms of collaboration, we're at AICHE and the AICHE Foundation are really very grateful to you and Comores for your support of our Doing a World of Good campaign and our priorities of diversity and inclusion and process safety and innovation. So in terms of diversity and inclusion, can you share your thoughts and Comores' philosophy on that? Yeah, it's, a, it's such an important uh, uh, topic, and I know uh, uh, we had a, a great session here yesterday mm -hmm. with, a, with a lot of folks really getting their ideas into the room. Um, I like the idea that it's inclusion and diversity mm -hmm. because I think it starts with inclusion, right. and I think it really starts with, you know, it's the comment we, 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 we shared a few minutes ago, which is how do you get the right input mm -hmm. into anything you do, right? How do you get the collaboration going? And true collaboration requires inclusion because you want different viewpoints inside of that. And I think that inclusion then drives diversity right. because if you're open, if you, if you create an open environment where you're bringing in different ideas, mm -hmm. then you should be striving to make the people around that table more diverse right. because you're going to get different ideas. So I think it's just a vehicle to get to higher collaboration and better decisions if you can include more people in that. And if those people are diverse and they have diverse ideas, whether they're culturally diverse, whether they're racially diverse, whether they're gender diverse, whether they're passport diverse, mm -hmm. you're going to get better ideas coming from that. And I think we've proven that over and over again. So driving to that, and we're thrilled working with the AICHE and the foundation around that, because I think this is something that will massively benefit the industry that we're all part of. Um, I made a comment today uh, in, the, in the keynote that 20% of the participants were women uh, mm -hmm. at the conference, which I, I think is moving up, but it's still nowhere near what the world balance is, right. which is 50% right. women. And I know women is, are just one element of the diversity we're talking about. But I think, we, I think you have to encourage it to mm -hmm. make it happen. Right. Uh, and then when you make it happen, you really get great results right. from it. Well, one of the groups that are attending this conference are young people. And a lot of them, including some in your own company, asked me to ask you this, is what lessons would you like to share or what advice would you have for an engineer just starting out in their career, um, either at Comores or really in our industry? Uh, it, you know, it's a question, as you can imagine, I get a lot. And um, I think back to myself, you know, I, I was an engineer, um, but I immediately was attracted to the business side. Uh, when I joined DuPont to the business side, and I tried to work my way toward that. Um, and I was given some good advice that I pass along to everyone else, which is whenever you have an opportunity, take it. Mm -hmm. And it's not always clear to you where that path is going to go. You can never just, I think some people like to feel like, oh, I'm going to lay out this map, mm -hmm. and this map is going to be my career, and everything is going to work exactly as, as I lay it out on the map. That doesn't happen for anyone, mm -hmm. right? But opportunities pop up. It might be an opportunity to go to a different part of the world. Mm -hmm. It might be as simple as an opportunity that, hey, I'm doing this role and someone's asking me to take on this project. Mm -hmm. And you might be thinking, oh, I'm too busy. Uh, so my encouragement to everyone is don't ever turn an opportunity down because it probably is going to lead to something mm -hmm. that you don't understand. And that will lead to something else and lead to something else. And over time, you're going to figure out you know, which road you really enjoy and what you want to take. And then the second piece of advice would be, whatever you're doing, be bold in what you're doing. Don't think about the next assignment. Don't think about the next job. Think about how do I just do extremely well in the role I'm in, mm -hmm. but be bold in that role. Don't just be passive. You know, try to make a difference in that role. It will get noticed and that will lead to the opportunities being presented. So they actually work together, um, and I always uh, try to, I know I always fought myself of thinking about 
well, what's the next thing I should be doing? Mm -hmm. Well, why don't you do what you're doing really well? Right. And if you do that extremely well, it's just going to create an opportunity for you that you can't see yet, and then you need to take right. that. And I think that's the way, at least in my opinion, that's what worked for me, right. and that would be the advice I'd give anyone Well, that's terrific advice, and I think a great way to close this uh, discussion. Thank you, and congratulations on many fronts. Congratulations on the Agile Award. Congratulations on obtaining Fortune 500 status, and congratulations on the really pace-setting turnaround that you led at Comores. Okay, so thank sure. you again for spending your time. We've been speaking to Mark Bergnano, President and CEO of Comores. I'm Shark Yusuf Zai for AICHE. Thank you for watching.